How's up, everyone? It's your boy, a big ass cannon! And today, we're going to analyze the new legendary banner featuring our favorite hero, our boy toy himself, Racist Roy! A man of utmost human virtues, it was no accident that he appeared after the introduction of the beast units. Now unlike other legendary heroes, Racist Roy has a very rich and deep history behind his character. This story is quite long and will probably give you severe brain damage, so stay a while and listen. So the story was like this. Once upon a time, there was a man named Nurgle. Nurgle loves dragons more than anyone else. One day, while working on a local farm, he decided to ride one while no one was watching. This went on for years until eventually the villagers found what he had done and took the animal away. In a fit of desperation, Nurgle opened up the dead zone using the dragon gate and had his pal Garlic Jr. take care of his children until the heat died down a bit. A few years later, Nurgle and his new pal Athels, the Grey, moved to a nice pad in a desert called Arcadia. After securing a nice place to live, the two pals went and fetched Nurgle's children back from the dead zone, and the family lived happily away from the eyes of the other racist humans scouring the lands. One day, however, his daughter Ninian traveled to the human world despite his warnings and eventually brought back a guy named Elliewood. Although Nurgle was distrustful of this young man at first, he soon discovers that the guy shared the same fetishes as he and the two would often talk well into the night about the pleasures of scale on flesh, a forbidden taboo that is illegal in most states. It was said that during his stay in Arcadia, Nurgle treated Elliewood as his own son. And so, with Nurgle's blessings, Elliewood eventually returned to his home in Fury with Ninian in tow, and that is how Roy was born. However, Despite his obviously well upbringing, his childhood was not a happy one. When the people discovered Roy's origin and familial ties to the Dark Druid, they shunned the poor boy. Furthermore, Hector refuses to have anything to do with Roy and kept his childhood sweetheart Lilina away from him, citing purity of essence. This, together with an illicit relationship with his teacher, gave Roy further shock, and he developed permanent brain damage. Dab, 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 dab. Hashtag squad goals. In his madness, he tried to get Ninian to wear a wedding dress and become more human. And when Ninian refused to do so, he killed her and claimed that she died of illness. When Elliewood discovered the truth of what his son had done, he develop severe brain damage, causing his eyes to bulge and enlarge and became permanently ill, allowing racist Roy to seize power. He then killed Hector and seized Lilina for himself, beginning the events of Fire Emblem Dragonbine. During the course of the game, the hero Sephiel raised an army composed of people from all walks of life to fight against the tyranny of racist Roy in the second scouring. What became of this battle? Guess we'll have to see in the legendary hero battle. Brain damage story aside, which I don't even know why I decided to just wake up this morning and develop through the power of my infinite brain damagemanship, let's actually get to analyzing. So, I have a rather mixed feeling about Legendary Roy, to be honest. How do I put it? I guess I kind of expected something a little... more original. See, the problem I have with Legendary Roy is that his playstyle isn't that much more different from Eureka and Legendary Marth. You stack buffs, we replicate it with as in-combat buffs, and then you're good to bring pain and destruction to everyone around you. Well, that's great. Except I am already doing that with Erika, a 3-4 to four star unit that I use when I'm extremely lazy and just want to carry a big stick to destroy the current content in a few minutes. Now, if you don't use these, then he's even more boring. He's just a red infantry then, with good stats. Psh, whatever dude, anyone can do that nowadays. 
So what he does have over those unit is that his Dragon Bind also doubles as a new sort of power creep. You know the new distant counter weapons that like Homeless Tiki has? But I mean, like I said, even that isn't anything new as Homeless Tiki, well, does that with Divine Mist. So still, instead of where I would have had to sacrifice a Hector to make this happen for Erika or Legendary Marth, Racist Roy does come with Distant Counter already and can still annihilate the Dragon meta. Though I fear that it might not matter all that much nowadays, as beasts are looking like they'll start overtaking it, and with all their multicultural nonsense. Well, at least this gives me some hope that this will finally allow my Ragnell or Landite or Raijin doll to start developing a secondary effect from refinement soon. Now that being said, bonus doubler, the A skill that defines the setup of replicating bonus stats. Well, six to all stats from bonus doubler certainly is something. And I say six because it's currently the most feasible amount you can get without jumping through some hoops. This little toy pretty much guarantees that racist Roy is father. <laughs> For me, unless his legendary SS blessings turn out to be absolutely amazing. Now consider what I just said. This is the same playstyle as Eureka in Legendary Marth. And guess what? They both are infantry reds. Roy has some big boy pants to fill to differentiate himself. Differentiate himself. Ah, I can't pronounce today. So let's take a look at his stats. Infantry with 169 BST is pretty hefty stuff. As that's disgusting Gen 3 BST showing itself again, which we've seen previously on both male and female Corin as their um, adrift forms. Now, he's fast as hell, but his HP is inferior. They spread his stats a little thin. Still, he pretty much power creep Legendary Marth all across the board, simply because he has a lot of stats. Except for one very, very distinguishing trait. Fire Emblem, and that the plus three from his Falchion would make up for the speed that, well, that Roy has over him. Now, why do I say this as if Legendary Roy is bad, where he is a... That's because the very strength of this setup is also its greatest weakness. This thing is very weak to panic. You are basically setting yourself up to get panicked, and when that happens, you're pretty much naked as far as A slot goes, along with a crippling debuff to now worry about. Now, normal Erika surpasses Legendary Marth because of two reasons. One, she has a base HP of 42 compared to Marth's 40. Now, that might not sound like much, but it actually is. Let's use the Panic Manor in Aether Raids as one example. The very first level says 40 HP or below will get panicked. Oops, Marth just got panicked. Alright. Say Eureka and Marth are now both plus 10. But then a Panic Manor level 2 hits. <gasps> hey look, Erika has 46 HP and doesn't get panicked. While well, Marth gets to suck a big fat one with his meager 44 HP. Now, of course, you can alleviate this if you end up pulling plus HP versions of Marth and Roy, but then you're investing on a plus HP hero, so do consider those choices carefully. Now, anyway, the second reason why Eureka is good is because Eureka is not a legendary hero. That means she gets buffed from other legendary heroes, and her HP can go to some astronomical heights with sufficient stacking, whereas Legendary Marth is kind of, well, stuck where he is. So this is pretty much what Legendary Roy has to deal with. I think that instead of him using it, he could instead give the same skill to Erika or Legendary Marth so they can end up stacking this twice, or three times, thrice, if they have Caden backing them up. Although I, I kind of don't think that this is necessary, I, uh, because Distant Counter is better for these types of builds anyway, due to it working better by staying in closer proximity to your allies in order to continue receiving said buffs in the first place. I mean, yeah, I guess you could use it as a quick burst of um, 
a player phase, but it's much better on the enemy phase where you just bait enemies to well, <laughs> kill themselves on you. So then, that leaves a few choices. Being that this is an A slot toy, you can either continue to push the red envelope with guys like, oh, uh, Ryoma, or go off to a different color. Now, off the top of my head, that would have made the most of it, would be the likes of Legendary Tiki, Joseph Harden, Fjorm, and I guess maybe Camus, and Xander, I guess. With Joseph Harden being the best at this due to being able to receive blessings to really trick out his HP and strong all-around stats. Or at least that's what I would have said if I had released this video yesterday. Turns out that it's infantry only. In which case, Fjorm is pretty much the only one who could take advantage of this with a native DC weapon. Hmm, well no, that's not quite right. We could also use Julia and her close counter against dragons, so now you have green. And beyond that, the next best thing is Fury 4 as general uses goes. Sure, yeah, you take 8 damage at the end of a fight, but what if your opponent is a bloody mess on the floor? Then, what exactly are some non-lethal damage, eh? It's much safer to use and even provides you with a solid number to execute ploys or other mechanics involving real, non-buff stats, instead of being dead in the water if your buffs were somehow panicked or interrupted by something. Anyway, on the other hand, because healers can't run fury though, I think that deadly infantry healers can definitely benefit the most from this arrangement. Not like they have better choices. Working together with other healers, even panic can be cleansed. So, hmm, I might have to boot up my plus HP as I'm up in Laden again. Because even his meager attack will become monstrous if we can add, oh, 12 to all stats to that. Well, technically just 6 if you don't count the buffs. But that's still better than most things healers can use, barring attack speed solo. Ah, and I just remembered other infantry with distant counter that can benefit from this. Infantry dragons, duh! Slap on a lightning breath and go to town with Naoi and Faye. Or I guess those two boring Korans. How ironic that they'll be pulling this skill from racist Roy. Bit of a shame to lose steady breath though, so I have to think of think about this over. Now that we discuss his main weapon in A slot, what other virtues does Racist Roy have? Ah yes, human virtues, the skill which brought about the meme. By standing next to a human at the start of a turn, he gets attack and speed plus 6 to himself and others. Ironically though, Racist Roy and Homeless Tiki would have worked so well together, combining their offense and defensive virtues, but no, Racist Roy's gotta be racist. Anyway though, by itself this skill basically saves you a C slot of 2 or 3 heroes and a mixed team formation. I mean, you just, you just gotta stay closer to your human pals, start your turn near them. In the near future, I'm sure that this could be significant, because there, I'm pretty sure there will be even more powerful C skills that will appreciate the safe space. Think of Infantry Rush as an example. Now finally, the last thing to talk about is his blessings. Races Roy's SS blessings for the people of his human empire. So to put it bluntly, rather than uh, it's 175 arena BST for himself or for his team, they're both equally stupid, except one is stupid good, and the other is stupid bad. Honestly, if they hadn't announced that these blessings will confer a new skill instead, I would have seriously believed that it just gives 175 for the whole team, given IS's wonderful track record. Still, this is so strange. Like, why is it that, that we're now going to have to wait till April to see what skills Races Roy is going to give with his blessings? Is this a new thing where they just kind of release incomplete characters and calling, a, and calling a thing now? This is like when they had to tell us in advance, Ooh, Binding Blade will be coming in March! Something is definitely a bit different in their planning phase. I'm pretty sure they're like, oh yeah, these guys, they're getting tired of the game, they're jumping ship. So could this be a sign that perhaps they'll finally recognize that 
recognize that their stockholder overlords are perhaps wrong in their way of thinking? Like, so they fire them by, oh, I don't know, tossing them into volcanoes and blowing them up with hydrogen bombs? Time will tell, I guess. Okay, so to wrap things up, let's go over the banner itself briefly. Red is great for Roy, Distant Counter, and Micaiah is a fine unit in of herself. She can give you res ploy if you really need to. Blue is kinda eh, Ephraim is kinda aged, Niles is a mess, and Corin is great for no follow-up. Though I wouldn't summon on this banner for him though. Green is good, Guntra is a horrible monster, her boyfriend Surtur is a horrible monster, and Corin is a pile of stats also known as a horrible monster. Finally, we have Grima making a big comeback in Colorless with Close Counter and Mikoto in tow. If I was still a spender and hadn't blew my load on Grima's face already, I probably would have visited there for a few copies of Close Counter. But anyway, that's about it. Our brain damaging analysis comes to an end. I hope you enjoyed the story. I thank you all for watching, until next time.